Well, thank you again for coming. I, would, I am delighted to be here. I appreciate that this is the end of a, well, for some of you, the end of a long day, for some of you, just the middle of, of a busy day. And I really do appreciate your being here. I want to talk to you today about, uh, about time. I've been studying time in earnest for about a year now. I've been reading across multiple disciplines. And because to understand time, you really have to read across multiple disciplines. And I teach in communication studies, so of course I examine the literature and in intercultural communication where I believe um, there is a, well, there is a prominent sort of a, a, a focus on time in this part of the field. But I also read a bit in anthropology, psychology, history, philosophy, religion, economics, business, linguistics, environmental studies, leisure studies, feminist studies, film studies, family studies. I barely touched the surface in physics and astronomy and biology, and I need yet to engage myself, I, I need yet to kind of gear myself up to focus on, on mathematics. But I, and I haven't even yet touched um, art history or art. And there, there are all sorts of relations, uh, relationships. <laughs> to the study of time. In fact, Vicki Phipps and I are talking about a possible learning community pairing intercultural communication with graphic design with a focus on time perspective. I'm not guaranteeing that. We're just talking about it. But basically, I'm set for an interesting research uh, program for life. I basically found myself interested in something that I can't imagine could be more liberal artsy at its core. Time is related to all of your majors somehow. And I became especially interested in time about 10 years ago when I began to feel its scarcity in my life. Work-life balance was my entry and my beginning interest, the entry point to the study of time, because it seemed to me that clearly I was doing something wrong. As hard as I tried, my attempts at work-life balance fell short. It was like my life was the square peg and the uh, clock was the round hole. And no matter how I turned that square peg, it wasn't easily fitting into the limitations of that clock, that round hole. So I think it's fair to say that I started reading about time mostly in an attempt to find more of it, more balance or more time. I would have accepted either. It didn't end up that way. I did not find more time. But I did find out that people have been trying to understand and organize time for over 5,000 years. I did think about my time beliefs much more, and that alone helped me. Some folks, such as the famous psychologist Philip Zimbardo, assert that even thinking about time, talking about time, studying time, can help us to slow down, helps our heart rates decelerate. For me, certainly, learning about time has been healthy. As I learned about time, I didn't feel like, that, like I was getting filled with knowledge. I did not feel like my head was getting bigger. I felt like my eyes were getting bigger. I was full of questions. Studying time, to me, has been a bit like the childhood game of imagining infinity, right? It's just a wonder. And I rediscovered that wonder. I found more of God in the everyday. I remembered the importance of humility. Those were my takeaway points, some of the things that I found in my study. So it, uh, my study of time afforded me some sense of wonder, a sense of the spiritual recommitment to humility, and finally some gratitude. But for you, I'm going to offer this short focus on time to hopefully allow you to think about how your education, um, to help you think about how a focus on time uh, might shift your perspective on what your education is about, what it's for, and how your education can enrich you with your own major or minor scented 
sense of wonder and appreciation. So that part is up to you. So a little, today, a little bit about what I've learned uh, about time along the way and how it might be related to liberal arts education. So first, a little bit about clock time, the development of clock time in America. Um, privileging recent history. This, so this particular um, time emphasis is from work closer to my discipline, that's intercultural communication, and also draws from psychology. So some of the basics first. Um, for those who have studied time in its basic form, when you, when you take a sort of a cultural lens to it, there are, certain, there are certain terms that come up all the time. And I'm introducing them first as clock time and event time. And um, usually they're described together for contrast, right? Either your clock time culture or your event time culture. In clock time, there are proper times for things. So there's a time for everything that you are expected to do in a time, in, this, in a sense, that time is arbitrary, right? So there's a lunch time. There might be a bedtime, right? And so, um, you know, there, there are all sorts of ways that this, that this plays out. Um, Clock-driven, arbitrary, monochronic, one thing at a time, one sort of linear approach to time, suggests, I mean, that, that itself is a, is a disciplinary framework. So you can't eat a hamburger for breakfast. Right? That's even one of the sort of the, one of the ways that you can sort of play this out. Does anybody in here think that there's a time for eating ice cream? No. <laughs> <laughs> you all are a good time. <laughs> but there are some people in here who think that ice cream, you eat that after dinner, right? And so that's just a that's a small benign sort of example. But clock time says. Um, there's a certain, there's a time for things and the clock privileges, the clock tells us um, what to be doing with our time. In event time, things happen in their own time. So our conversation d would not start if it wasn't time for it to start. It, so classes wouldn't necessarily have to begin right at the you know, strike of the, of the hour. Or, um, you know, your conversation wouldn't end. And so the conversation was done. The clock doesn't tell you what to do, right? And so in event time, the conversation is done when it's done. It's more organic. And it's positioned as this sort of um, polychronic as well. So, so there can be multiple things going on at once. It's not linear in the same way of, of clock time thinking. Okay. So in event time, I mean, there's always a way to be late, right? There's always a way to be early or late. But event time, there's less adherence to the clock. There's less strict adherence um, to the timekeeping device to keep us on track. So it's just a little bit, you know, it's more, it's more centered in the, in the present. It's more centered in the thing that's happening in front of me. Okay. So what we have here, as the argument goes, um, two basic time orientations, right? Two basic time orientations. Very often positioned as a dichotomy. Perhaps some of you might be thinking, well, that's a little odd, right? Cultural time orientations, and there's really only two options. Well, Actually, I mean, I, I, I did a fair amount of work in my own, looking at the literature in my own discipline, and this is the primary, this is the primary framework for understanding cultural time orientation and intercultural communication. I think it teaches us a lot, but it is often positioned as a dichotomy, as monochronic versus polychronic, and it exists inside of a particular context, right? And so if it's positioned as a dichotomy, I want to hear from someone who has, this is a smart room, what are some critiques? What are some critiques of dichotomous thinking? <laughs> Give me some. Real life is not that neat and simple. 
Real life is not that neat and simple. Give me some more. Usually more than two options exist. Usually there's more than two. Okay, so it says you get this or that, or you get that. Yes, yes, give me more. You mean there are two options, it's usually a sliding scale? What do you mean by sliding scale? Okay, so sometimes, sometimes it's not that you have this category and that category, that there's all this space in between, right? Yeah, good, good. Other, other, other critiques. Could you have both? Could you have both? This is either or. What about both and? We've all been hearing about that. Both and thinking, right? What about the possibility of both? What else? What about situational that's not cultural? What do you mean? If my boss wants me, it is people-centered. <laughs> and I will be late to my next appointment. <laughs> exactly, as well. And so what you have here is a sense of power, right? From the critical media studies scholar, right? And so there's this, this sense of power that, that all of these critiques of dichotomy help us understand time a little bit more. It can help you understand some of what I was experiencing as I was reading about how time is, is framed in, in intercultural communication studies. So, hooray! Hooray for critical thinking! And that you, you knew that it existed in the context that there's always something more, right? So always asking ourselves what's more is, and we didn't forget about power, right? And the ways that power can be misused. I'm not afraid of the end of the day, keeping you, your eyes peeled up here. Cats, cats will do it. <laughs> so let's examine power in intercultural communication textbooks. Okay. Now, inside this sort of dichotomous um, framing, inside um, intercultural communication uh, emphasis on time, we have a normalization of one kind of time. Okay. So Western time is certainly positioned in subtle ways in our in how we teach about it in my in my discipline, in very <coughs> subtle ways. Sort of, um, it, it comes across as normalized. It's not just described, right? So it comes across as more rational, as more um, natural, and and these are just a few of the quick examples that I have that are representative examples, even though they are pulled from just a few of the textbooks that I was looking at. So the way that people use time can result in misunderstandings. Because people from monochronic time cultures are used to carrying out one conversation at a time. Whereas people who use polychronic time carry several conversations simultaneously, which confuses and frustrates. <laughs> monochronic the users of monochronic time. So what's a the problem there? Did I make it too obvious? <laughs> Why do we care so much about the frustration of monochronic time users? Why, we could just as easily flip that description, right, and uh, talk about what confuses and frustrates the users of polychronic time. It is absolutely the case that in many of the textbooks that I looked at, Monochronic frustration with polychronic time came up over and over, right? Now, it is the case that I'm a very sort of monochronic and linear thinker, and I can't um, really engage in multiple conversations at once as some people can, right? <laughs> that being that ability to engage, it's, it's not just multitasking, it's really engaging in multiple things at once as related to a time orientation. That's, that's something that is not a skill that I hold. Um, and yet, the misunderstandings are on, you know, are if we only have two sides, they're certainly on both sides. But in the textbooks, it's, it's, it's constantly this sort of like frustration with those, you know, those ways, those people that just engage in all this sort of distracting chaos. It's almost like polychronic is chaos, right? So, um, Certainly, there are multiple critiques, and, and what we have are, you know, only monochronic persons are, you know, are posited as frustrated. There's no parallel treatment of the potential confusion and frustration of the wacky, weird, monochronic thinkers, right? And so there are a, a whole host of these possibilities that I was running across that were subtly embedded, right, and assumed this monochronic normalcy. Another example. 
To many Asians, time is more of a relational issue rather than a clock time issue. And in some less developed countries, life moves to the rhythms of nature. The day, the seasons, the year, such human inventions as second minutes, hours, and weeks have no real meaning. Problems? Yeah, we're seeing some problems. Okay. Anybody want to speak to these problems? I have a magic clicker. I'll just move forward. Certainly polychronic persons, or polychronic persons here posited as, as left developed, right? Simply don't understand mechanized time. And uh, monochronic persons are not positioned as ignorant of anything. They're not held accountable for what they do not know or how they do not act. It's certainly something um, that I found multiple, multiple times. And I thought it would be fun to sort of flip the bias and imagine what the description would look like if it were written from a different position. So I have some examples of flipped bias, right? Monochronic persons, such as Americans, move to the beat of a mechanical time. Monochronic persons are not in tune with nature. Such natural happenings as the sun rising or birds migrating or normal biological aging have no real meaning, right? I don't see that in the intercultural texts that we use. Right. Another one. For Americans, time is a valuable commodity. Something to be measured and used wisely. Americans manage their lives according to schedules, which are often divided into hourly, daily, weekly, monthly, and even yearly segments. Deadlines and due dates are a constant reminder of when projects must be completed. This is in contrast to other cultures, such as Mexico, where it is considered important to get to know the other person before initiating business discussions. For Americans, time is a valuable commodity in contrast to other cultures. Right? Now certainly you're getting yet, a, a yet more sense of, of, of problems here. Certain kinds of agency are valuable to Americans. right? And for shorthand, we simply say that time is valued by Americans. And without sort of recognizing that we're, we're taking away the activity or the, what we're engaging in, and we're just calling that time. And we're saying the time becomes the cover for what it is that we're doing. And we say Americans value time and others don't. Right? So many other less developed cultures, according to this, do not value time at all because persons from such cultures, because they might not be punctual, according to clock time, um, they're they, it's positioned that they don't value time at all. Right? Punctuality didn't always, wasn't always even associated with being on time. Right? It, was a, it was a sort of a social code or a moral, it, I'm gonna link sort of social codes and morality in just a moment as well. So this is frustrating to me as I'm <laughs> reading through all of this. Um, but again, I get a little sense of, of fun out of flipping that bias. So here we have another. The continuing value Mexicans place on time is illustrated by corporate practices in which persons doing business spend much time getting to know each other, building relationships that are intended to and may last well beyond the immediate deal. In contrast to America, business people in Mexico value time. Right? Americans may find this confusing. So I was just trying to flip it over and over. I can do this for days. <laughs> the French do not share the American sense of urgency. Americans do not share the French desire to take all the appropriate time and task necessitates. Punctuality is not considered a virtue in Saudi Arabia. Unlike Saudi Arabia, I said, completing a task fully and completely <laughs> before leaving it is not, is not a virtue in the US. In fact, American business people will often leave a business meeting before business is concluded simply because they have another meeting scheduled. Privileging the other before you. So um, I could, as I said, I could do this for days. 
I did do it. I have many more examples if you're interested. But basically, it's, it's way too easy to take something like cultural time orientation and from either perspective, really, to suggest that the other, um, the other is wrong or rude. Clock time people will say that event time people are slow. They're inefficient, they're lazy, they're backwards, they're rude. Event time people might say that clock time people run around like little robots, that they have missed the forest for the trees, that they are cold, that they are rude. So, I mean, even though we exist in a world where both, in this case with two sides, both could misunderstand each other, we're still not operating in a, uh, we're still operating in a world where um, there's, there's more normalization, right? of linear time, of rational time. Rational, quote unquote, time, right? And so we're erasing the true value in US American and monochronic thinking by simply saying we value time, they don't. So let's be clear about the activity I say. Let's just take time out of the equation in some of the ways that we're describing time orientations. Um, that seems a little bit strange, but that's one of the things I think that we need to do. So in the normalization of linear time, what we have is an argument that comes from um, anthropologist Carol Greenhouse, who notes that what passes for the natural rationality of linear time is in fact a set of cultural claims about the efficacy of law and specific technologies of social ordering. So how do we get to a place where we talk about where we sort of the, the 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 learned nature of it is sort of so divorced, and um, and and let's talk about how we got to a place where not just time but clock time became a ruler. And again, much of this history is from anthropologist Carol Greenhouse, um, who wrote Moments in Time: Time Politics Across Cultures, from historian Michael O'Malley, and from social psychologist uh, Robert Levine who wrote The Geography of Time that my Holden students read in Holden Village in January and February. So Carol Greenhouse asserts that um, the idea of time that has dominated public life in the West since the 13th century was not indigenous. It came to Europe with Christianity. The expansion of Christianity into Europe brought with it two ideas about time which had long roots in Jewish and Christian tradition. First, the origin of time and creation, and second, the end of time and a day of judgment. The linearity of time derives from the geometric connection between these two endpoints. To speak of linear time is to refer to the image of time as an irreversible progression of moments, yielding ordinal conceptions of past, present, future, so, for example, one Judeo-Christian argument about linear time, Robert Levine talked about in, in one of his books, is this notion of, of God blessing the seventh day, right? And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. It was written in the book of Genesis. God devoted six days to creating the heaven and earth, and on the seventh, the work is finished, not by building a holy place, but by creating a sacred time. So, greenhouse... Carol Greenhouse, the anthropologist, right, again noted that time, in theory, represented the incompleteness of the world in relation to God's completeness. Individuals could aspire to, um, to completion only in salvation, that is, in joining God. The existence of God, always and uniquely total and true, says Greenhouse, was by definition outside of time, since there was nothing else for God to become and no alternative to God's reality. Linear time took shape as the segment linking creation and judgment. All time was viewed as the history of salvation. The practical meanings of linear time took shape around this logic. Now, our beliefs and understandings about time have always been an uneasy mix of science and religion and politics and culture. And we often treat it like fact. And the more I read about time, the less I know about it. 
the more I could imagine life structured differently, certainly, the more shocked I am at how so devoted to the clock that we are, that many of us are, that we can't even imagine alternate possibilities. Um, it is truly, it is truly shocking in a way as you read more. Right? And so, um, centuries pass. And well into uh, the 19th century, oh, so, I'm uh, sorry, over, over centuries, time-keeping devices get more and more sophisticated, right? Robert Levine noted that well into the 19th century, the world was still blanketed with uncoordinated calendars and time zones. So even though we had all of this sort of more precision, more precision, <coughs> more precision, we didn't have standardization. And so, um, so, the world was blanketed with all of this, uh, you know, uh, sort of inability to, to, to operate by the same time as, a, as other people, same clock time. And so in the United States alone, there were 70 different time zones um, as late as the 1860s. The Industrial Revolution changed all that, and the new technologies demanded this previously unimagined regimentation and coordination of activities, right? The clock moved to center stage. Scientists were arguing for a total coordination of temporal standards. Certainly scientists were arguing for coordination, but it wasn't pure science making the argument. Business and industry championed having a stricter, more universal accounting of clock time for the railroads, right? Many of you might know this history. Um, and so we have this, you know, desire for a standardization with railroads and for weather forecasters as well. Right? But if each city had its own local time, as it did, then it was very difficult to schedule, um, for, you know, uh, meetings or schedule for the railroad. And in fact, railroad stations that were just a short distance away from each other, a, a train could leave a station, pull into a station, and actually go backward in time because they were operating by different local times. Right. So it was very hard to schedule with 70 different time zones, and railroad companies were all about coordinating time, synchronizing time, standardizing time. And with this desire for standard time, proper time also, in, in my framing, but proper time kind of literally began to be sold literally began to be sold. Observatory. Raise your hand if you've ever been to an observatory. I won't call on you. Wee! Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> observatory. So there was this man named Samuel Langley who was in charge of the struggling observatory in Pennsylvania. He profited from its timekeeping functions. He, he got it sort of up and running and very you know, precise timekeeping functions. And in a brilliant entrepreneurial move, he persuaded Western Union to connect the observatory in Allegheny, Pennsylvania to the city, connect the observatory, right? And soon after, he began to literally sell the time in the form of observatory time signals by telegraphic transmission to industries throughout Pittsburgh for standardization. Time was a commodity. <laughs> time has been a commodity for a very long time, right? So since the very beginning of this movement towards standardization, we also had this sort of you know, industry connection and this entrepreneurial connection to it. We can't talk about commodities without talking about desires and about values, right? You see where I'm going. So with a desire for a universal time system, Time, time itself began to be valued as something different, something began to be valued differently. And we had entangled in a desire for standardization um, not only sort of this, this increased value, but also a moral component to it, right? So Robert Levine, psychologist, had noted that uh, the director of this time service um, at uh, Harvard and later at Yale, imagine, being like literally a timekeeper. Um, took the moral high ground, Leonard Waldo, by arguing that time needed to be under the control of scientists. It absolutely needed to be. And that the furnishing of correct time, 
he declared, is educational in its nature, for it inculcates in the masses a certain precision in doing the daily work of life, which conduces perhaps to a sounder morality. Standard time was heralded as a, as a way to keep track of disorganized workers. Keeping a watch on was a, keeping a watch on someone was a popular phrase that took on a new dual meaning. It literally had a component of keeping a watch on. And so the moral gatekeepers of the new industrial society, as Levine called them, were convinced of the virtues of clock time. The latecomer was characterized as a social inferior, and in some cases, a moral incompetent. Now, you're an audience of students, for the most part. I have colleagues and students here. Certainly, organizing time and managing time is an absolutely essential skill for all of us, right? But this turn toward linking time to morality or character judgment is, a, is, a, is an important move. From, from an earlier sense of, of, of how we value time, how we understand it, value it, right? And it is an important extension for us to critique. Now this room, for example, is not so punishing. But do any of you have classrooms where if you're late, um, everyone can see you walk in? Yeah? <laughs> what do you do if you are late to class and everyone can see you walk in? Or what have you seen other people? I saw you shake your head. Can you say what some other people might do? You. Mm-hmm. You just walk in. You just walk in. Oh, okay. So you're just like, okay, here I am. Well, it's better to be there than not to be up Yeah, I absolutely agree. Anyone have ever? S yeah, go ahead. Usually, people kind of duck their heads mm -hmm. when they walk in late. What's with the head duck? <laughs> It is. It, there's something going on with the head duck, and there's a power thing, right? Anybody else? Yeah, I do a little, you know, I remember doing the little scoot, you know. Sorry, you know, <laughs> trying to say I'm sorry. There's definitely this sense of um, sometimes, I mean, people talk about this notion of, of shame, shame or guilt that's associated with being late. Like, what is it saying? What is it saying that I'm late, right? And, and that's a part of a, you know, like, really, I'm not a bad person. I, you know, I got caught by the, the train, <laughs> right? Or I, there was an accident in the road, and I tried to tell you why. You know, don't think I'm a bad person. And, and, and there's this sort of, this, for some people, just a, a very um, strong sense of, of guilt that can go along with how we, um, how we handle or, or mishandle time, right, if, we, if we're not mastering those minutes. But clock time is learned, and valuing clock time above other kinds of time um, is also taught. And so that's what I was looking at. That's what I've been um, sort of paying attention to. What are, what are some ways that I'm in, encouraging or discouraging or is sort of troubling this notion of clock time? Are there ways that we can imagine that do we have choices about clock time, event time? Right? There's some questions that some of my students have pondered. But certainly as we have learned to pay attention to the clock and as we fear the clock and as we you know, just sort of walk through life uh, looking at the clock, pace has increased. Pace is a part of clock time, of understanding clock time. Right? It was just after the first mechanical clocks began making the hours that the word speed came into the English language, first appeared in the English language. And not until the late 17th century did the word punctual that had to do with a stickler for details of conduct, someone who, you know, very upstanding person. Not until then did punctuality have to, anything to do with time. Okay. So it's sort of evolved, right? Now, many of you have studied pace. You might have studied Frederick Taylor, time motion studies, um, aimed for efficiency, right? So we have this time, we have this metric, we have this increased pace, we have this desire for efficiency. How fast can you do something? How efficient is your workstation? Some time motion studies literally looked at how, what is the, you know, the most efficient way to pick up a, a box or to move from a place to, so that, so that um, workers would waste less time. So we have to produce, we have to avoid wasting time, producing faster. And with a focus on productivity, 
There's an association with consumption. There's an association with wants and needs and this expansion of goals, right? I am making a link, an environmental link too, right? So with a focus on wants and needs and expansion of goals, this is Gergen, as cited by time use researchers, Robinson Gandhi, with people's use of time, they might, you know, you, it's good to have lots of goals, but with expansion of goals comes this increasing, whoops, sense of the necessary. Somewhere I have a slide that says something about the sense of the necessary. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> but with increasing goals, we have this, what Gergen calls this expanding sense of the necessary, right? Other kinds of time, um, you know, this with the, wouldn't allow us to reach all of these these goals if I want to just produce more and and I have to act fast to get that. So free time, sometimes these researchers tell us, hey, we have more time than ever before. We've got more leisure time. You'll read arguments about that. Even you know, very recently, arguments in the New York Times about about more free time that people supposedly have. But free time is expanding, but not as fast, even if you believe that, which I don't. Um, but free time is expanding, if you believe it, but not as fast as people's sense of the necessary. So their perception, their, the, how they perceive their lives, right, certainly um, does not um, suggest a felt expansion at all. And so Robinson, these time use researchers, Robinson Gandhi said, quote unquote, the gap, this gap results in rushing and in dysfunctional attitudes towards time and this postmodern proliferation of issues that seem to need attention is almost endless. I talk to my classes a lot about how we structure our time and what are sort of the values that undergird some of how we structure our time and all of us or most of us right um, really work really hard and really work a lot and really you know, spend a lot of time trying to make sure we stay on top of things. Um, and we sort of ask ourselves, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm asking you to think about this, this sense of the necessary and what part of our lives really, um, you know, what, what, what options we might have as we think about this, this notion of an expanding sense of the necessary, I have to, ha I have to do it, I have to have it, I have, you know, I have to do all these things. So with an expanding, so here we have, some of these are, are time use studies, right? And so um, time use researchers are not sentimental, right? <laughs> they are very sort of strict and rigid about the study of time, and it is how are you using your time? And so we have all kinds of information on how people are using their time, very you know, sort of efficiency oriented in some ways, or you can imagine it's used that way. It tells us something, certainly. It tells us something important. Um, but time use researchers, again, are very much about figuring out how we're filling those minutes, how we're filling those days. Not, um, not really thinking about the possibility that days themselves We've decided what that what that means. We've decided on, we've decided on a sixty minute hour. We've I mean, we've decided, and those things have changed. Actually, uh, we've decided on calendar systems that have changed over time, right? Um, so let's see. So here's some of my oh, there's my son. So environmental links, what <coughs> environmental links, can you see environmental links? We have environmental studies folks in the, in the room. There are environmental links, yeah, good. I couldn't help but think about all the UPS truck technology that's right. there. Right. So that as we consume more, they can get our packages to us with fewer left-hand turns and things. Right, right. Oh, yeah, exactly. Can you say more about that, yeah. the left-hand turn thing? <clears throat> Do, I, have you seen all of these stories about what's happening with UPS 
trucks, and, and most of them now have GPSs in them, and they're doing all of these studies about how to be most efficient. So they're now delivering like twice as many packages in the same amount of time, down to the fact that they map their route. Uh, computers elsewhere around the country map their route every day so that they're only making right-hand turns rather than left-hand turns. Um, and they can't back up more than so many times or they get in trouble. And, and so it's all about how can we get you stuff more quickly, which didn't work this Christmas. So. Right. <laughs> And I know because I did one click. <laughs> <laughs> Loads of environmental links that you can that I'll, that you can certainly make some of those connections yourself. But does anybody else have others? UPS is great. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, when we link efficiency to productivity, and productivity is linked to the production of consumable objects, right? So how efficiently we can produce things, how efficiently we can consume things, that means that we're producing more consumables, which of course has impacts on resources, impacts on pollution kick out. Like Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, Jeff. Um, as you're talking, I'm thinking about you know, the, the uh, illusion of the primacy of the day-to-day -day time and our concept of time. And environmental time, geologic time is on such a different scale yeah. As we think about our own impact, it seems like it doesn't fit. And so why my own changes in behavior would have any realistic, because during the time frame that I see, I don't see those changes. And that's the, and that's the time frame that matters. Um, so a mismatch between our own sense of time and what's happening in that larger environmental time. Absolutely. And in psychology, you can read a lot more if you're interested in this about like past, present, and future orientations. And to a certain extent, if you can't, you know, um, well, many, 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 many ways that you can talk about environmental links. But but one is just is is not is is not having that connection to the land um, and not imagining myself in the future or my impacts into the future. That's another way. This is Holden. This is this is the Cascade Mountains of Washington State, where um, 18 students spent time with studying consumerism, studying religion, and studying time and culture. In this, with no screens or few screens, right? No cell phones, and um, the connection to nature there is amazing. And those students came back. Many of them came back. Some spoke earlier about about having a greater sense of the need to recycle or of you know of composting and of just you know just sort of recognizing um, some of the some of the ways that they do impact the environment and I absolutely make that connection to our sense of time as well right okay many others I can have you I can have you think about that on your own um, Carol Greenhouse again got a lot out of her work so that uh, writing in time politics across cultures that other kinds of time are actually other formulations of agency. And that's how I like to think about it. Right? And the connection to your education, you're change agents. You are change agents. You can shift perspectives to a point <laughs> To a point, right? And the study of perception of a supposedly perfect or uniform metric, like I barely touched the surface here, but I, this is because I, you can barely touch the surface when you're studying time. <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> um, but I found more motivation to affect positive change because of my research in cultural time orientation and across this amazing array of disciplines. It was a truly liberal arts sort of interdisciplinary endeavor. I was humbled by it. And again, I found more motivation to utilize the talents and the, the power that I have to affect positive change and, and more acceptance of my imperfect life as well and my imperfect attempts to, to master the minutes of the clock. And in fact, and that's what I want to ask you to think about with your educations at Augustana. 
even time use researchers, even time use researchers agree that perhaps the most critical variable in how satisfying future time use will be revolves not so much around technology or efficiency or the reorganization of society, but around people's ability to appreciate. So we need to re-examine our consciousness, say Robinson and Gandhi. We need to re-examine our consciousness of everyday life to become more aware of and thankful for the good things in life as they occur. Still quoting them. Instead of time-saving skills, perhaps we could cultivate time-savoring skills in order to appreciate the simpler delights of life as they're occurring. Taste of good food, presence of good company, the delights of good fun and silliness. To be happier and wiser is easier to increase appreciation levels more than efficiency levels. And only by appreciating more can we hope to have a sustainable society. While efficiency, at least as envisioned in American society, um, always starts with wanting more, appreciating may start both with valuing more, what is already here, and with wanting less. But I want a lot for you at Augie. <laughs> Right, and I value your time. Thank you for being here. What questions do you have about, or thoughts, or connections? What is it that brought you here? speak to that you can but when I talk to students I've had several assignments over the years that I've sort of practiced including giving my students an assignment to do nothing like you are not allowed to do anything for several hours hours the first time I assigned it um, my students said do nothing for two hours like in a row <laughs> they asked me in a row and um, it's a, it was a big deal there have been multi multiple assignments like that where, and I had students shooting me daggers. Like, we laughed about it later, but a couple of students, I'll never forget the first time I just tr tried to do that, a couple of students looked at me like, you cannot make me not do anything. <laughs> like, what? And I think it might have been something like week nine. <laughs> 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 the next time I did it, they, they were like, can we do this over the weekend? Yeah, it didn't have the same sort of punch. <laughs> um, no, serious pace issues. It's, there's a notion of time scarcity. Um, that's uh, like even regardless of how much time we actually have, we don't feel like we have time. And like with any scarce resource, you might um, get a sense of desperation. Like if you didn't have air, you would feel pretty desperate about that, right? And in some ways, some people have argued that if we, um, that in thinking that we don't have time, we also are less efficient with it in a, in a way um, because we're flustered, we're worried, we're anxious. Um, because if you go around feeling like, oh my gosh, I don't have any time, um, that itself is energy consuming, it's exhausting. 
And so, I mean, I, I, yeah, any students want to speak to pace of life? I mean, I do. Am I right? Yeah? Okay. Anybody not feel that? Hurry sickness is a phrase that comes up in the literature. Just hurry sickness. Just, yeah? I feel like there's a, a huge pressure to stay busy. And when people see you kind of just hanging around, yeah. they wonder what, like, what is the matter with you? And what's wrong? Right. And, and, and busyness as status is also, also shows up in communication literature. I talk to my students about like end of year holiday letters that say, we were so busy all year long, right? And so there's, there's a way that that is absolutely true and factual. And there's, there's a way sometimes that like, do you get punished for, in some ways for not being busy? I forgot to actually ask my students, my intercultural students, but I actually let them out of class five minutes early the other day and said, walk really slowly to your next class and see if anybody notices. <laughs> Just even slowing down a little bit. I forgot to ask them, but usually, you know, people might notice. Yeah? Is part of that anxiousness related to you know, like seeing like, okay, you have your life, you have a certain amount of minutes and you need to fill it up with as much as possible before you're gone. Is that like a fear of, you know, you're not making the most of things? Even when you push yourself that hard, the anxiety will, you know, not make the most of that things. I definitely think how, I mean, and, and folks much, you know, in the literature do speak to this notion of, but if I think that death is the end for me, for example, here's another spiritual, a spiritual link to it, is depending on one's um, sort of thought about life after death, that there's also a connection there that some people have made really interesting arguments about, right, in other disciplines. But, but yeah, like I'm a, like there's some, yes. <laughs> Does anybody want to speak to that? That's a very good question. Because then you were talking earlier about like, the introduction of clock time and how it you know, got heightened and heightened and you said, mentioned things like, you know, bringing Christianity and things like that. It's, I mean, does that heighten the fear of death? And I don't, I don't know the answer. I don't know enough to compare. Like, I don't know if Christianity, I'm not saying it's to blame or anything, but, you know, puts more of an emphasis on that, that, you know, you got a limited amount of time until something happens. Um, well, I mean, but how has that changed, like, between different cultures and things like that? Well, it's like time is a cycle. Yeah, Laura Hartman. Well, I mean, one difference that I see, it, and others can speak to this too, but one difference that I see that's often pointed to as a difference between what you might call Western religious views and Eastern religious views is that most of the views in the West do not believe in reincarnation, so this is your only life, whereas most of the views in the East do believe in reincarnation, and uh, it seems to me that that's got to have an, an effect on how you see time. But one thing I also wanted to point out is, you know, I, I'm sure we can blame Western Christianity for a lot of our busyness, but there is that, I mean, in that in that original story where God creates the world and then rests on the seventh day, there's a command to rest one day out of every seven. So, I mean, that's in there, and we don't do it. But if we did it, we would have a lot more resting time, and perhaps that would help us slow down based on something from the Western side of the religious world. And even if you're all about efficiency and productivity, rest makes you and helps you be more efficient. Even if you don't want to critique that, rest as a part of that, right? Um, I, I'm glad that Alexis mentioned um, uh, Eastern cultures and all that. When we were in China uh, on, a, on a East Asia uh, program, uh, we were not able to go to YouTube and Facebook and all these great things that we do on a regular basis. So for me, it was kind of like my time got a whole new dimension. Right? So I have time that I have to fill in and I can't you know, um, do it in front of my computer. Um, so I had to go places and meet people and deal with them and uh, um, dab in Chinese. But um, for me, one time ended and another one started. Did you have the same feeling in Washington when you had nothing around you? And then again, I feel like the transition when I came back was kind of like, 
this is really weird. Like, what happened? Yeah. It was just a blur. Are any of my older people here? Oh, I can't imagine a fuller place. We had no cell phones, we had no Facebook, none of that stuff. It's so funny, because we were surrounded by everything. These mountains, these trails, these people who were amazing. Have you ever had an accidental conversation with someone who turns out to be just this amazing person, right? It happened every day. And so, um, oh my goodness. It's, it is really funny because we were isolated, quote unquote, you know, off the electrical grid. They create, in Holden, they create their own electricity, you know, from a, there's a hydroelectric plant, you know, near the village. Um, Many times people have asked what it was like to be so isolated. <laughs> and I've never felt less isolated in my life. Um, so yeah, it has been a switch. I have my cell phone with me. You know, I am still a Facebook holdout. But, you know, but no, I'm really connected. Um, but yes, it is a different environment. But I, I am bringing back, I really am trying. Um, but it has to be a conscious thing because it's very countercultural to um, to view time otherwise, right? And there's only so much choice that we have, right? We still operate in a system that punishes, right? Yeah. Um, as far as like education goes, do you think professors demand too much from students? Um, yeah. Like here, you know, you go in the very first day on the syllabus, it's like you should be spending this many hours studying, no. and then it's like, and then if you go to apply for a job, they're like, what's your campus involvement? You need more, and yeah. it's just like, when you're demanding so much, are you really getting out of a liberal arts college what you're supposed to be getting out? I think that is a wonderful question. I know in my department we've talked a lot about um, the ratcheting up of expectations over the years from when I started our senior inquiry projects and where they are now, they're amazing. There's some amazing work happening and it's amazingly hard to get there because y'all are working hard and we're really working hard. Your professors are working really, really hard too, right? But students, yes, I think we ask more and more. Now, we make sure that we, you know, we try so hard to make sure you have the tools to be able to do it, and so that's definitely something. Um, I don't know the answer to your question. I think your question is good. Does anybody want to speak to that? Yeah. I want to speak to that, and I know we have a couple of associate deans here who maybe can talk about the reason that now says on every syllabus how much time you're expected to serve, because I think this says something incredible about how the government thinks about education. So, so what I was going to say, I think it's an excellent question as well, and one of the things about time that's unique and horrible and insidious is that you can measure it, right? And so it's one of the few things that you can talk about when you talk about education and talk about how do you know that education is happening? Well, the amount of hours that we spend in a class seat surely should mean something, right? And because it's one of the few things you can quantify like that, the regional and, and sort of national accrediting bodies are the ones who are demanding that very language because it's something, seat time is something that they can measure. So there's sort of a dialogue in higher education now. Um, don't even ask me. This is the stuff that associate deans like really love to talk about, so don't ask me another question about this, because I'll just go off. But uh, there's really a tension in, in, in the sort of higher ed community right now between seat time, which we know we can measure, but is imperfect because it's only your time sitting in a seat, um, versus competency and how we sort of look at how people learn, right? Um, and we haven't arrived at a way to measure competency. So we'll measure the amount of time that you spend. Right. And that is, I find that as a professor very hard. Yep. Those little charts that you have to put on your syllabus, because I mean, you, all, you all know it takes some of you 20 minutes to read something. It'll take somebody else you know, an hour. And so we have this average time thing. And we do our best to, to sort of figure out, but that's we didn't we didn't make that up. We have to do that. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a strange thing. Let's see. Yeah. I'm curious if you could speak a little. You mentioned we were talking about rest a little bit, um, and there's all sorts of research that rest is really good for productivity. And if we've actually worked eight-hour days and 
had downtime, that we would be way more productive in those eight-hour days than we would be in our 15-hour days, for example. Yeah. Or that having vacation time, so countries like uh, most European countries that have a month or six weeks of vacation time, that in fact are more productive with the time they're at work than, than we are with the time at work. Um, so we've got all this good research base about wouldn't it be great if we had more rest, but it seems like there's some big change that needs to happen. Could you speak a little bit to what would, how do we change some of the systemic pieces around um, time, particularly in our culture, in ways that would be seemingly really beneficial for both industry and worker bees? I would love to be able to answer that. But I, I can, I mean, maybe I'll start and then other people hop in. That would be great. Politically, I mean, there's a, it's, there's a political need. We need people, you know, to sort of be at the forefront of, um, of mandatory. I mean, like in some uh, some of these countries, it's not just that you have time off. I mean, Americans have vacation time they don't use, or you know, um, family leave that is there by law, but by corporate culture, you really can't take it, right? Or you know, or you know, but we're also way way behind. Almost every, I mean, nearly every country in the world, in terms of um, progressive family leave, you know, policies and so politically, that's that's one way. Um, who else can speak to this? I know there are others in this room. Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting how the uh, like inability, and I think you're like talking like about America specifically, you know, in contrast to Europe, um, and how that reflects our uh, value on time, and especially time spent at work. You know, time is money. And I think that's, you know, there's nowhere where that's more true than here, where it's, you know, if time is money, and if you just keep working hard enough, that kind of ties into, like, you know, the American dream, then you'll succeed. But I think that might also tie into what you're saying about how maybe we need to step back and appreciate, <coughs> I think you had that on one of your slides, like, time savoring instead. Right. Um, but then you're talking about, like, political will, and that isn't really going to happen unless, you know, you have, like, a social will, right. like, people want to you know, step back. They want to, you know, take that vacation time and demand more vacation time um, and stuff like that. October, um, there's a, something called Take Back Your Time Day. But there was a movement about 10 years ago, John DeGraff, if you're familiar with John DeGraff, Affluenza, um, he started this Take Back Your Time Day. And, you know, for a short time, there was this sort of engaged political movement to, to do just this, to have people just stop, spend time, you know, with people they love, doing things they love with their pets. I mean, they had all kinds of interesting creative <laughs> posters that John DeGraff had multiple students all over, in colleges all over the country going for that. Um, it sort of lost steam. In some ways, it might have lost steam because of the very issue that it was trying to overcome, and that's we're all so busy. How many of you just automatically delete your email? Every time, like you get a digest or something, do, do a lot of you just like delete it because you get over email overwhelm? Yeah, um, technology overwhelm. I mean, it's like fast, 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 fast. And who? I don't know. And anyway, I was thinking about that, Margaret. Maybe I can find it. <laughs> I don't know, but it's great. Yeah. Yeah. When do you try to find it? Yeah. Because yeah, I was going to say, related to that, the the social and the political are really wrapped up with the economic here. The sociologist Juliet Shore uh, talks about studies that were done in the 1950s and 60s about how increased productivity in, in industry and in the economy was going to free up leisure time. But what actually happens is we end up working more because we end up producing more because this enables us to buy, buy more stuff. And stuff equals status, right? The, the entire economy is built on the production and distribution and consumption of consumer products, right? And so if we, we value time, but we value stuff more because the, the system is constructed in such a way that rewards us 
for having more and better stuff than other people have, right? And, uh, and the people who run the economy are, have a vested interest in making as much money as they can selling stuff and having people work to produce the stuff, and they don't care about your time. Have you heard about the corporate suicides and working yourself to death in Japan? They have it even worse than we do. <laughs> yes, and there's, I mean, there are, anybody want to speak to that? Yeah, I was, I was actually just going to bring that up. Um, in Japan, you can work in a company for 20, 30 years and you still get five days off a year um, after national holidays. Um, yet you have uh, the US with the highest GDP, the biggest economy in the world, you have China and then Japan and then Germany. There's obviously a relationship between how much you work and how much uh, money you spend and what is really the status. Um, how, what, what are you willing to sacrifice for uh, the consumer goods? So. Um, I think it's more of what a certain culture values um, over other things, um, and it's just a, a different culture. There is no right or wrong way. Um, it's just that different cultures value different things. Do you want to see the Yeah, go ahead. I don't know if sound is up. Why do we work so hard? stuff. Other countries, they work, they stroll home, they stop by the cafe, they take August off. Off. Why aren't you like that? Why aren't we like that? Because we're crazy, driven, hard-working believers, that's why. Those other countries think we're nuts. Whatever. We're the Wright Brothers insane? Bill Gates, Les Paul, Ali. Were we nuts when we pointed to the moon? That's right. We went up there, you know what we got? Bored. So we left. Got a car up there, left the keys in it. Do you know why? Because we're the only ones going back up there, that's why. <laughs> but I digress. It's pretty simple. You work hard, you create your own luck, and you gotta believe anything is possible. As for all the stuff, that's the upside of only taking two weeks off in August. Nice bump. Hey, Wendy. Do you you like should, the counter? You should pull up Ford's response. I will. <laughs> Vegetables. That's the upside of giving a damn. Nespa. <laughs> and with that, it's time for ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.